Hey everyone, today we're going to cover the general harmonic rules of counterpoint according to Noah Gallon and Marcel Biche's counterpoint treatise. This is my preferred treatise for studying counterpoint. It's relatively unknown outside of France because it is in French and I'm not really sure if there's an English translation. In any case, it's a great book and both Gallon and Biche were fantastic musicians. They both taught counterpoint and fugue at the Paris Conservatoire. And fun fact, Messiaen and Dutilleux both studied with Noël Gallon, one of the authors of the book. Okay, let's dive in. I'm going to skip over the obvious rules that are pretty much universally accepted amongst counterpoint treatises, like, you know, forbidding parallel fifths or octaves. And instead, I'll talk about the more subtle rules and exceptions. So let's start with consecutive intervals and chords. We cannot have more than three consecutive imperfect intervals in a row. Here we have four thirds in a row, and in the next example, four sixths in a row. This isn't allowed because we start to lose the independence of voices. Similarly, we can't have three or more first inversion chords in a row where all voices move in parallel motion. However, we can have more than three first inversion chords occur consecutively if at least two or more of the voices move in contrary motion with one other voice. Here we have four first inversion chords in a row, but the last three all have the upper two voices moving in contrary motion against the bass, so it's fine. Next, we're going to discuss consecutive fifths and octaves in detail. Take a look at this first example where we have a perfect fifth moving to a diminished fifth. This is allowed. A perfect fifth can always move to a diminished fifth. The inverse, however, that is moving from a diminished fifth to a perfect fifth, is not allowed. If we're dealing with four or more parts, we can allow a diminished fifth to move to a perfect fifth if two conditions are met. First, the movement must occur between inner voices. Secondly, it must involve a plus six three chord moving to some sort of tonic chord. For those who don't know, plus six three is French figure to bass notation to denote a diminished chord in first inversion. So you can also think of it as the leading tone chord in first inversion moving to tonic. The tonic chord can either be in root position or in first inversion. Next up is a really interesting example because it involves parallel fifths that are allowed. Between the soprano and alto, we have a perfect fifth DA moving to another perfect fifth EB. But in this particular case, it's allowed. Why is that? Well, let's analyze this a bit. Notice D, E, and B are all functioning as passing tones. When parallel fifths occur, but the second fifth involves at least one non-harmonic tone and contains one note that creates a dissonance with another note in the chord at that moment, then the perfect fifths are deemed acceptable. This makes sense when we think about it because by definition, non-harmonic tones aren't real harmonic events. I mean, it's in the name, non-harmonic. So when the second fifth involves a non-harmonic tone, then that fifth isn't actually a real perfect fifth. It's just an apparent fifth. It's a purely melodic event and thus we don't consider it harmonic. In the next bar, we have another acceptable parallel fifth, this time occurring between the bass and tenor. Careful here though, while the B might look like a real harmonic tone, it's not. It's a passing tone. This bar is outlining a C major chord and B doesn't belong to a C major triad. Again, since this fifth involves a non-harmonic tone B, and has a dissonant note D within it, it's perfectly acceptable. To recap, parallel fifths are allowed if the second fifth contains a non-harmonic tone and if one other note in the chord at that moment is dissonant with any note in the chord. As my teacher once told me, it's always satisfying to write parallel fifths that we're actually allowed to write. By the way, parallel fifths like this can be seen in the repertoire. Parallel fifths or octaves separated by at least a whole note worth of note values are allowed. In this bar, we have two half notes separating the two fifths. Two half notes equals a whole note, so these are okay. In the next bar, we have only three quarter notes separating the two octaves, so these are forbidden. We need at least four quarter notes to meet the whole note value separation requirement. By the way, I'm addressing real perfect fifths and octaves now, so these are fifths and octaves that involve harmonic tones. We can have the fifths and octaves occur in closer proximity if they are approached in contrary motion. Here, the perfect fifths C, G, and G, D are only separated by a half note, but since the second fifth is approached in contrary motion, it's allowed. Careful, however, if the second fifth is attacked, 
that is accompanied with another note, it's not allowed. This makes the fifth or octave stick out way too much. In this second example, the fifths are only separated by a single quarter note, but because they're approached in contrary motion, they're still acceptable. We can even have fifths in closer proximity occur in parallel motion if one of the fifths contains a non-harmonic tone. Here, we approach the second perfect fifth in parallel motion with only a half note intervening between the two fifths. But because the first perfect fifth involves a passing tone, D, they're okay. Similarly, here we have two fifths occur in parallel motion with only three intervening quarter notes, but because the first fifth involves a neighboring tone, it's fine. In general, whenever a perfect fifth or octave involves a non-harmonic tone, you're usually in the clear, but you still have to make sure all conditions are met for each specific case. A direct fifth or octave is when an imperfect interval moves to a perfect interval by similar motion. Direct fifths and octaves are not allowed amongst the lowest and highest voice. They are allowed amongst any other combination of voices if either one of the voices moves by step, so this direct fifth is okay because the G moves by step, or if both voices leap, but one of the notes in the second fifth or octave has a harmonic note in common with the triad of the previous chord. In this example, the direct fifth is leapt into, but because this E is also a chord tone in the previous triad, it's allowed. There are no hard rules for consecutive and direct dissonances, but we have to be careful with how we treat them. Of course, dissonances are dissonances, whether direct or consecutive, and need to always be treated properly as such. In general, when writing consecutive dissonances, we'll very often prefer moving from a harsher dissonance to a softer dissonance. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, here, we have a major seventh moving to a minor seventh. A major seventh is a harsher dissonance than a minor seventh. If you play the two, I think you'll hear that a major seventh packs a bit more of a punch. For seconds, minor seconds are harsher than major seconds. In three voice counterpoint, we want to avoid consecutive dissonances that move from soft to harsh, as shown here where we move from a softer dissonance of a minor seventh to a harsher dissonance of a major seventh. However, once we get to four or more voices, even this poses no problems because the extra voice generally softens the harsher dissonance. This is counterpoint, so it's always important to keep the independence of voices. Here, this direct motion to the dissonant major second confuses the ear since it comes out of a unison. It's hard to tell which of the two voices moves either by a third to E or by a second to D. Even if the voices were played by instruments with different timbres, it'll still be a bit clumsy and heavy-handed. In contrast, this direct dissonance is perfectly fine. We can clearly distinguish the voices, the passing dissonance is treated properly, a textbook direct dissonance. There are also no hard rules for voice crossings, but again, we have to be careful. Voice crossings should above all enhance the melodicism of both voices while retaining their independence. Something like this isn't desirable because we have the same exact major second occur which obscures voice independence. It also isn't particularly melodically interesting enough to be justified. In general, we want to prioritize approaching voice crossings by either contrary or oblique motion. In counterpoint, any doubling is allowed, even of the leading tone, except when the leading tone is in the bass. In this example, we're in C major, and we're doubling the leading tone B, but since the leading tone is in the bass, it's not allowed. In two and three voice counterpoint, we cannot approach unisons on the downbeat. In four or more voices, we can, but sparingly, and it should really be justified melodically. Because of this, I'll mark this with a transparent X. Unisons on the weak beats approached in contrary motion, as shown here, are ideal. Unisons approached on a weak beat and in oblique motion are also acceptable. This is counterpoint, so we're a bit free with our harmony, especially when it comes to function and doublings. But there are still some rules we need to follow. First off, we cannot have root position diminished chords. In this example, we have a root position diminished chord built off the leading tone, moving to tonic. This is not allowed. The only time we can have a root position diminished chord is in four or more voices at the penultimate bar. And it must be a product of a 2-3 suspension in the bass that resolves to the leading tone diminished chord as shown here. The C is our dissonant suspension that resolves to B, giving us that root position diminished chord built off the 7th degree. In an exercise, we can only have two incomplete chords, not counting the first and last measures. The first and last chord can always be incomplete, but in between those two, we cannot have more than two incomplete chords. An incomplete chord would be a chord that doesn't contain all the notes of a triad. 
we're also not allowed to have two incomplete chords in a row. Here we have two incomplete chords in a row. Notice they're both missing a third note that would complete the triad. However, if we're prolonging the same harmony, this rule doesn't apply. Here we have two consecutive incomplete chords, but since we're prolonging the same harmony B minor, this really only counts as one incomplete chord. This means that if we had a complete chord and prolonged it into the next measure, it would count as a complete chord even if the next measure resulted in an incomplete chord. We always want to have at least a third or sixth present in a chord. Writing a bare fifth is to be avoided at all costs. Finally, we are allowed one accidental per exercise. In minor, we're allowed to freely use the accidentals that involve the different forms of minor, of course, but accidentals outside of those are restricted to one per exercise. If we do use an accidental, it must occur in passing or neighboring motion. That is, it can't be a harmonic tone. Take this example in C major, where the accidental B flat is introduced as a neighboring tone in order to avoid what would be a tritone outline had this B flat been the usual B natural of the key. So there you have it. These are most of the harmonic rules that need to be followed. Now you're probably thinking, how the hell am I going to memorize all this? And it's not easy. Having a teacher is, I think, the best way to internalize all this. The process of having your work corrected by an experienced teacher cements the rules much more concretely in your memory than if you were to only have, say, read them in a treatise. When you spend hours on an exercise and then have them returned with a bunch of markings, you're going to take note of what you did wrong and be sure not to make the same errors again. Furthermore, as a beginner, it's just way too hard, if not almost impossible, to keep track of all the rules while doing an exercise. An experienced teacher 9 times out of 10 will point out mistakes that you'd never even notice at first. This is why counterpoint takes so much discipline and attention. Failure is almost a prerequisite. But with each failure, we build more concentration, attentiveness, and sensitivity, which allows us to further appreciate and understand music. Thanks for watching. Next video, we'll tackle three part counterpoint. Don't forget to follow me at Bach to the Basics on Instagram. I have been a little bit slow posting there recently, but I'll be back on it soon. So stop by. Thanks again and see you next time.